The Boy Who Became Father Christmas, The Story of Santa Claus by James Wilmot, published by The Difference Press and available on Amazon as an ebook. Prologue. The wind howled over the crest of the mountain, driving snow and ice into his eyes. The deer surged forward, but the snow was too deep. Onward, boys! Onward! Just a little further. The deer were up to their haunches in snow. The sleigh began to stick. Onward, boys! Onward! The deer pulled one more time. The body of the sleigh came away from its runners and rolled over into a deep drift of snow. It rolled over several times and finally uprighted, but it was now completely covered in snow. He stayed at the reins and called into the wind in frustration. Not here, not now! Time passed, the night drew on, and the wind fell. The mountain was once again silent and the moon shone, illuminating the old man's face. It was now covered in snow and his eyes were closed. Then a voice whispered on the wind. Chapter 1 Nicholas was an only child born in a small valley town at the foot of an endless mountain range. He was tall for his age with dark curly hair, blue eyes and a nose covered in freckles. He lived a happy life with his mother and father in a large house in the centre of town. The town's cobbled streets were lined with stone houses and shops. The people of the town were wealthy and lived comfortably. The children were not that different than they are today, playing games and attending school. His father had an important job, but Nicholas did not truly understand what he did. But he did know it was something to do with the harvest market held once a year outside of town. At the last full moon of every autumn, Nicholas would ride with his father and many of the town's traders through the night to the market between the town and the foot of the mountains. When the procession arrived at dawn, one of the townspeople rang the bell in the large empty market building to call down the mountain folk. Nicholas looked back to the town in the valley almost a day away. He turned and looked across at the line of trees at the foot of the mountain. It was steep and stretched up to the sky. The mountain was covered in dense trees until its peak disappeared into the clouds. The market was a small collection of empty wood sheds with the main market building at the centre. The market town itself was surrounded by a stone circle that had been on the hillside for longer than anyone in the town could remember. Nicholas was frightened as night began to fall and he stayed close to his father. As the night went on and the full moon rolled across the sky, lights and strange sounds began to emanate from the trees. At dawn the mountain folk began to arrive. They looked different from the townspeople. They were shorter and dressed in scruffy clothes. They all looked miserable. Nicholas thought that they should look happier and more grateful considering that the townspeople would be giving them the means to survive the winter in the mountains. They arrived into the market pulling carts full of goods. Some carts were pulled by reindeer, others by hand. The townspeople and mountain folk traded through the day. The mountain folk provided cheese, meat, animal skins and wool to the townspeople. This was traded for coal, wax, grain, oil and other things that the mountain folk needed to survive the long winter. Nicholas spent the day playing with his friends while teasing and keeping their distance from the children from the mountain who didn't play at all and just helped their families in the market. Nicholas was nine years old when he heard the call of the mountain for the first time. He was playing with his friends near the woods when he felt the autumn wind switch direction and a sudden chill went through his bones. The bells on the reindeer began to ring as they started to kick and pull on their tethers. Then a sound came down from the mountain. A sound that was like a long moan, as if the mountain itself cried out in despair. Everything stopped for a moment. Then the mountain folk quickly packed up their carts and headed back into the trees. The townspeople also packed their wagons and rolled back to the valley. Once they returned home, Nicholas looked out of his bedroom window and up at the mountain, now in darkness save for just one or two tiny lights winking in the trees. Winter arrived the next day and the snow fell for a week. The people of the town carried on with their daily routines until preparations were made for Christmas. Nicholas's house was a grand one, and even during the long cold winter months it was warm and cosy. Every year the Christmas tree would stand proud in the bay window of the living room. It would shine bright and its warm glow could be seen up and down the street. Nicholas loved Christmas and so did his parents. They would spend their evenings sat around the Christmas tree telling stories and singing songs. On Christmas morning, Nicholas would wake with a wonderful surprise. At the foot of his bed would be a small toy. It was simple and made of wood. It was a gift that seemed to magic itself out of nowhere during the night. Nicholas's Christmas gift was the envy of his friends. Although a simple toy, it gave him so much joy and entertainment through the rest of the winter months. 
Nicholas was a happy boy and had no idea of the changes that lie ahead and the extraordinary direction his life was going to take. Chapter 2 One spring day, shortly after Nicholas's twelfth birthday, his teacher called him back at the end of school. There had been a terrible fire at his home. His father had tried to rescue his mother, who was still inside, and his parents had been lost. With his parents gone, he was told he would now have to live with his closest relative, who lived on the mountain. Nicholas's world had collapsed, no family, no home. The next few days drifted by. He stayed with his teacher and his wife until word was received that his grandfather would meet them at the market crossroads. Nicholas didn't even know he had a grandfather. His teacher was a good man and lived with his wife in a small house on the outskirts of the village. He had been friends with his father for as long as Nicholas could remember. He had, of course, taught Nicholas and his friends to read and write. He was a patient and quiet man, much like Nicholas's own father. One evening, Nicholas found himself exploring their attic and found a wonderful brass telescope pointing out of the window and into the sky. He looked through the eyepiece and gasped at the sight of planets and comets that were revealed to him. Nicholas smiled for the first time in days. Nicholas's teacher, Thomas, was very happy to teach him further about the nature of the heavens beyond the valley. It took Nicholas's mind away from his loss and thinking about his parents. When several more days had passed, Thomas packed Nicholas a bag of clothes and some school books. Nicholas was a clever student, and Thomas hoped that these basic tools would help him to continue to learn in his new home. They travelled through the night by horse and cart to the marketplace at the foot of the mountain. Thomas distracted Nicholas from his fears by bringing along his brass telescope and compass and showed him how to navigate using the stars. Nicholas saw more planets and galaxies that night and learned about the wonders of the sky, but truly he wondered what use this knowledge would be now that he would be living in the wilds of the mountain. As they arrived at dawn, there was one man waiting for them. He was stood at the edge of the forest next to a reindeer that was tethered to a tree. He was a huge man, nearly seven feet tall and broad, nothing like the rest of the mountain folk. As they drew closer, Nicholas could see that his grandfather had a long white beard covering much of his face, but he could clearly see his eyes, and they were very sad. Thomas and Nicholas's grandfather exchanged quiet words, and then turned to Nicholas and put his hands on his shoulders. It's time to go, Nicholas. Take care and look to the stars for guidance. He gave him the brass telescope, compass and maps of the heavens. Nicholas turned to his grandfather, who forced a small smile of reassurance. Come on, boy. We need to move quickly to get home before night. Chapter 3. They walked together into the trees with the reindeer following. The path was rocky, narrow and steep. Nicholas slipped and tumbled. His skinny frame was not a match for the unfamiliar terrain, and he could feel his grandfather becoming increasingly impatient with his delays. Very soon, his grandfather turned, picked up Nicholas and flung him over the back of the reindeer, which carried him for the rest of the day up and further up into the mountain. There was no snow, but it was so cold. They arrived at the village at twilight. The village was in thick woodland and the huts and cottages were set apart from each other. It was a collection of stone huts and cottages either side of the path. They were small and low with small windows, large doors, sloping roofs and a chimney. A small chapel marked the centre of the village and it sat by a small brook which babbled its way down the mountainside. A mill wheel dipped into the brook and turned slowly. Reindeer, goats and small cows wandered between the huts and some even peered out of the windows. The mountain folk stopped to regard this strange procession. It felt that all the eyes of the village were upon him, looking at him with suspicion and distrust. They carried on moving through the village and further up the path. They soon arrived at a cottage set apart from the rest of the village. It was also small and made of stone, but it seemed to be set into the mountainside with only three visible walls. Nicholas's grandfather tethered the reindeer and entered the cottage, leaving Nicholas to find his way off the deer's back and pick up his belongings. He slowly walked into his new home. Nicholas saw a large fireplace and little else. A bed was made at the back of the cottage and a bunk was set into the roof. A table, two large chairs and a stool were put to one side. A small solitary doorway was set into the back wall. It was locked with a table in front of it. There's nothing for you in there, just an old cupboard, his grandfather muttered. Suppose you'll be hungry. Nicholas was hungry. He hadn't really eaten for days. His skinny frame was even thinner than usual. Yes, I am, replied Nicholas as he gathered his coat around him. You'll get used to the cold. Just keep moving when you're outside, his grandfather said as he sparked up the fire. In no time the cottage was warm with a cosy orange glow. 
Nicholas's grandfather gave him a steaming bowl of stew and some bread, which was eaten silently and gratefully. It was the most delicious food he had ever tasted. While he ate, Nicholas's grandfather sat in a chair by the fire, lit his pipe and stared intently at him. You're a tall one, aren't you? Tall, like your pa, but you've got blue eyes, like your mother. You'll need to put meat on your bones if you're going to get by up here. If you were a new reindeer, they'd leave you out in the snow. A long pause followed. I've seen you at the market. You were next to your pa. I watched you growing up. I didn't know I had a grandfather. Nicholas replied. Had a falling out, your pa and I. He fell for a town girl and didn't want to live on the mountain anymore. Reddy could live down here. Sort out the market and make sure we got more for our troubles. It worked for a bit, but I reckon it's all scuppered now. Why? Nicholas asked. Town's fault let you keep us up. You're working hard. They give us enough to survive and take what they need from us to live the cosy lives. You had a nice big house, didn't you? Nicholas remembered his home. He missed it terribly. Don't fret, boy. You're here now and I'll keep an eye on you. But you'll have to earn your keep. I've made up a bed in the roof where your pa used to sleep. Best get some rest. Nicholas climbed into the second bunk and lay in the dark, listening to the strange sounds outside. Something shrieked outside in the night. An owl? Something shuffled past the cottage. A bear? His grandfather snored all night. Nicholas woke at dawn, wrapped up warm, and followed his grandfather outside. These folks will stare at you, but they won't talk to you. Reckon you're a spy for the town, or sent by the wee folk to cause mischief. Wee folk? Folks up here are scared to death of them. They live up past the snow line, where the snow never melts. They cause all sorts of trouble. Take the wheels off wagons, block the chimneys with wood. Nasty little creatures. His grandfather paused. Caught one once. Nicholas laughed at this tall tale, but his grandfather turned and regarded him. Not a laughing matter, young'un. The conversation ended, and they set about their chores in silence. The reindeer, cow and goat needed milking. The hay in the feeder needed to be changed, and the stable needed mucking out. By midday, Nicholas was exhausted, hungry and covered in dirt. He wasn't used to hard work, and the large animals frightened him. By nightfall, Nicholas fell asleep at the table once he had eaten his dinner. The days turned into weeks, and Nicholas and his grandfather slowly got to know each other. His grandfather, although outwardly gruff, was a clearly a kind man inside. He cared for his animals and put their needs before his own. They once found a wild reindeer calf that had broken its leg. His grandfather put it in a splint, and it slept in the bunk for several days, while he slept in the chair by the fire. But he was strong as a bear and could fell a tree with just a couple of swings of his axe while Nicholas struggled just to lift the handle. Their home was set away from the village and they rarely spoke or saw others. One day when they shared a pot of nettle tea, Nicholas asked why he lived separately from the mountain folk. I used to mix with them, but they didn't like the way I did things. So when your nan passed away, I thought it best I'd leave them to it. And that was all he had to say. The summer months waned and autumn arrived. Nicholas found that his favourite time was at night when the moon rolled over the mountain, bathing everything in a beautiful glow. He would often gaze at the stars that burned in the night and use his telescope and maps to chart the skies. As autumn drew on, these nights became longer and longer. Nicholas had been fortunate enough to see the northern light several times where bright curtains of colour danced across the sky. Even the reindeer looked up in awe at this natural wonder. But during the day, he still struggled to get about and constantly tripped and became tangled in tree roots. One day, Nicholas found himself in a particular pickle involving a bucket and some rope when he could hear giggling in the trees. He looked up and saw a young girl about his age looking over at him. She had wild red hair and piercing blue eyes. She held a bunch of flowers and was being followed by a heavily pregnant reindeer. Nicholas had seen her several times flitting through the trees, but had not been close enough to speak to her before. I'm Nicholas. I'm Rose. They played together until her father called out for her to return home. When the last moon of the season began to wax, the village prepared for market. Although not a trader, Nicholas's grandfather had got around the mountain on previous years, but had decided not to go this year. 
But Nicholas desperately wanted to go. His friends from the town would be there and maybe his teacher. He wanted to let them know that he was all right. He wanted to tell them about his life in the woods. But his grandfather was insistent and Nicholas saw him get upset for the first time. Your pa won't be there. I'm looking after you now and I've no pause to go, he said quietly. The market bell rang and the villagers went down the mountain. They were gone for three days. They had just arrived back when the call of the mountain echoed through the trees. Nicholas and his grandfather brought their livestock into the house and battened the windows shut. The following night the very mountain felt like it was shaking. The wind howled and snow came down in such quantities that just after two days they could not leave the house. That's us for the winter then, his grandfather muttered. And it was. They were there until spring. Chapter 4 After a few weeks, Nicholas was losing his mind with boredom. He had read his school books many times over and even had to resort to reading his grandfather's books on animal tracks and traps to occupy his mind. On Christmas Eve, they lit a candle to remember lost ones and settled down to sleep. That night, Nicholas dreamt of Christmas past, his parents and their Christmas day. As Nicholas woke on Christmas morning, he almost forgot where he was until the reindeer downstairs broke wind and served him a very clear reminder that he no longer lived in a grand house in town. But when he did open his eyes, he was greeted with a strange and wonderful vision. As Nicholas looked beyond his bed, he could see now that the cottage was decorated with wonderful garlands of cones, berry and ivy. The fire was roaring, and his grandfather was sat next to it, wearing his finest waistcoat. Morning, young Nicholas, and a very merry Christmas. His grandfather smiled at Nicholas, his eyes twinkling through his tiny round reading glasses. At the bottom of Nicholas's bed lay the most wonderful toy, that is how Nicholas's first Christmas on the mountain started, and he couldn't remember a day when he had laughed so much and had so much fun. They sang songs, played games, drank warm berry juice, and for Christmas dinner they had a small but wonderful roast dinner. In the evening, they both drank milk, and Nicholas ate the most delicious biscuits he had ever tasted. No one up here likes Christmas much, or at least they don't know much about it. They work so hard, they don't know when to stop. One year, I reckon I'll dig my way to every house and make them enjoy it, whether they like it or not. As Christmas Day drew to a close, their small and meagre feast had caused the little cottage to shine in the night. Thank you for my present, Grandfather. Nothing to do with me, boy. I read it's the spirit of Christmas that paid you a visit last night. Nicholas went to sleep happy. Their celebrations, as his grandfather put it, broke the back of winter. Nicholas liked to think that it was their Christmas celebrations that had called for the arrival of spring because the days seemed to pass by faster now, the sun stayed up for longer and soon the snow began to melt. When he had finally emerged into the daylight, Nicholas stretched and stood up straight for the first time in weeks. The animals were released from their winter shelters and ran, jumped and kicked for joy. Nicholas took a long walk through the woods and around outside of the village. The spring flowers were breaking through the snow, birds were singing in the trees as the mountain woke from its long winter sleep. The smells of spring filled Nicholas's nostrils and everything looked reborn. The people of the village busied themselves with clearing out their homes and airing their belongings after being cooped up for so long. As Nicholas walked back home, he noticed a crowd of people near Little Rose's cottage. As Nicholas drew nearer, he could see the reindeer that Rose had been walking with before winter. It was lying on the ground and was clearly in distress. Nicholas's height meant that he could see clearly over the crowd. Within minutes, the reindeer had given birth to a tiny calf, but once it was cleaned up, it was clear that this was no ordinary reindeer. It was as white as the winter snow. One of the villagers silently picked it up and carried it up the path and out of the village. Nicholas felt his grandfather's hand on his shoulder. They don't like the white ones. They think they belong to the wee folk, so they take them up on the mountain to fend for themselves. They must manage all right, because they've never seen a dead one, but never seen them wandering around either. They returned to the cottage to get on with their jobs. Within days, the snow had completely gone and spring was in full bloom. The trees were in leaf, rabbits and other animals moved freely between the cottages and huts. While he wasn't working, Nicholas spent his free time with little Rose. They were the same age, but Rose was a tiny creature. She could move over the rough terrain and through the dense trees like a sprite, whereas Nicholas always had to struggle to keep up. They became good friends. Nicholas worked well for his grandfather during the day and he would spend evenings sitting by the fire listening to his wild stories about the mountain. One evening, Nicholas asked him about the time he caught one of the wee folk. I was a younger man and just married your nan. We came back from the church one day 
and one of the wee folk had blocked the chimney and smoked the house out. I saw him head off into the trees out the corner of my eye, just like a wisp he was, like smoke. I was faster back then, and I chased after him. I followed his tracks in the snow for two days until I finally caught up with him. They'll tinker about with anything, but there's one thing they can't stand. What is it, Grandfather? Knots. They can't untie knots. It drives in crackers because they can't leave them alone. So I knocked in my bootlace, crept up behind him, and tossed it over. While he was fooling around with it, I tied the other lace around his ankle. I dragged him all the way back home and locked him in the workshop. What workshop? Never mind that now. I locked him up for a couple of days and I shouted in a way that was driving us round the bend. But on the third day, it all went quiet. I popped my head around the corner and the little sprite had taken my tools and carved a rocking chair out of a single piece of wood. Where is it now? I'm sitting in it. No, Grandfather, the creature. We kept him for a little while and then we started to feel sorry for him. I was about to let him go when there was a knock at the door. Nicholas's blood ran cold. Who was it? It was the Mountain King himself. Came to reclaim one of his own. He couldn't come into the house. He wasn't invited. So I did him a deal. I told him that I'd return this creature if I could fill my bucket with treasure from this hall in the mountain. He agreed and went back up the mountain. So I took the little creature up past the snow line where the snow never melts and I took him back to the hall of the Mountain King. But I'd been tricked. He had no gold, and his hall was as dark and as empty as his heart. He sat there on his throne and laughed at me. He told me to take anything I wanted, and the bucket would always be full. What did you take, Grandfather? What was there? Well, fate's a funny thing. There was treasure right under his nose. The cavern under the mountain was full of coal, so I filled my bucket with that, and I've never wanted coal ever since. The Mountain King used to be a man years ago, but he'd forgotten our ways. He doesn't hold our values. He'd forgotten what the warm glow of fire feels like. He didn't know that coal is as valuable as gold for us folk up on the mountain. Problem was, I tried to share my fortune with the people in the village. But when they found I'd been dealing with the wee folk in the Mountain King, they wouldn't take it. What's more, they didn't want to speak to your nan and I, for fear of bringing on the wrath of the wee folk on the village. So I closed up my workshop, and we mostly kept ourselves to ourselves from then on. It broke your nan's heart when your pa moved off the mountain. She passed away shortly after he moved to the town. It's a shame she never got to meet you. She would have been rather fond of you, I reckon. What workshop did you have, Grandfather? Where was it? He paused for a moment and walked over to the table in front of the cupboard door and pulled it aside. He turned a heavy key in a rusty lock and the ancient door creaked open. Chapter 5 It was dark and dusty inside, but soon Nicholas's eyes became used to the blackness and he began to see the contents of this strange room. It was a long narrow chamber carved into the side of the mountain. A long table ran along the centre of the room and was covered in half-finished furniture and toys. The stone walls were covered in tools, and a drawing board was propped against the far wall, with rolls of paper and rolls of complex plans on a bookcase. A thick layer of dust covered everything, and it smelled musty and old. This is the oldest cottage on the mountain. They built it on the cave where the first settlers lived. Our family have lived on this spot for a long, long time. When your nan passed away, I didn't have the heart to carry on making things. I couldn't sell anything at the market. There wasn't much point, so I shut up shop. Nicholas was fascinated by this ancient room with so much potential. Will you teach me, Grandfather? Can you show me how to make things? I think I shall, kidder, his grandfather replied, and they shook hands. They cleaned the workshop that night and sharpened the tools ready for morning. Over the next few months, Nicholas learned how to turn and work wood. Although with some small initial disasters, he quickly realised that his lack of coordination on the mountain was compensated with very good carpentry skills. Autumn arrived and the harvest was gathered. 
Although Nicholas was pleased with his work that year, he was most pleased with the achievement of finally allowing his grandfather to take him to market. It had been over a year since he had left town, and Nicholas was looking forward to seeing his old friends. He wanted to tell them all about his life on the mountain. The miller had gathered his flour, the candle maker had packed his goods, and the rest of the villagers had prepared their wares. Everything was packed onto carts and the procession made its way down the mountain. They reached the edge of the woods at the foot of the mountain just after sunset. The mountain folk were not comfortable in wide open spaces, so they made camp among the trees. The full moon shone through the treetops, casting strange shadows on the ground. At dawn, the mountain folk rolled the remainder of the distance out of the trees and down to the marketplace. But it was very clear that something was very, very wrong. The marketplace was usually a bustling area of townspeople and villagers from all over the mountain, but there was no one to be seen. Nicholas's grandfather walked up to the meeting post at the centre of the market house and read aloud what was written on a piece of parchment. As he was the only one of the few people on the mountain who could read, the mountain folk listened to him intently. says here that the townsfolk have decided to move the market to the other side of the valley, over past the town. If we want to trade and get supplies, then we need to go over there. The mountain folk stood stunned for a moment. Then they started to shout in protest and argue. What would they do? Winter was just days away. Could they trade and get back to the village in time? What other choices were there? The miller then suggested that they try an alternative route and go over the top of their mountain and trade with the towns on the other side. It would take less time and bring them closer to the village on the return trip. As if to secure the argument, the call of the mountain echoed on the wind. Three days simply wasn't enough time to travel to the far side of town, trade and return to the village. They would have to try and scale the mountain for the survival of the village. Nicholas's grandfather protested. He was one of the few people that had been over the mountain and he knew how dangerous it would be. But the villagers were insistent. They would go with or without Nicholas's grandfather to lead them. He begrudgingly agreed to help them. He thought that, as it would be better for him to lead them, to see them all get lost, but he insisted that the majority of the group stayed behind in the village. The deal was struck, and the mountain folk quickly retreated up the mountain path. They moved quickly and silently, with no time to lose. They reached the village at twilight, and the group quickly shared what wasn't essential. Six people, including Nicholas's grandfather, had volunteered to carry on over the mountain pass. Nicholas returned to the cottage with his grandfather, who crouched down in front of him. There's enough food inside to keep you going till I get back. Use the coal to keep you warm. He picked up the ever full bucket and emptied the contents into the corner of the room. The bucket was instantly refilled and he emptied it again and again until a large pile of coal sat in the middle of the room. It was enough for winter and more. Nicholas's grandfather's eyes were sad, although he was smiling. He ruffled Nicholas's hair and vanished into the dark. Nicholas stared out of the window and waited. Chapter 6 Three days passed and nothing. The snow fell and froze. He couldn't open the front door or windows, alone and trapped. Nicholas stayed in the cottage for many more days on his own. Eventually, when the food stores were long gone, hunger drove him to try and leave the cottage by any means. So he put on his grandfather's coat and belt, drew it twice round his waist and scrambled up the chimney. He emerged on the roof exhausted and covered in soot. He slowly stood up on the frozen snow completely alone. The snow was firm under his feet and he explored further. He found that he could now move through the woods faster than ever before, without tripping over roots and rocks. The brook was frozen, and the miller's water wheel was now covered in snow and ice. The houses of the village were almost completely buried, with just the roofs and chimneys visible. Nicholas foraged for food, collected some nuts and berries, and returned to the cottage, his thin and wiry frame fitted down the chimney with ease. Nicholas explored further over the next few days, the silence made him happy, and he became used to being alone. But the sun barely rose over the mountain at that time of year. The snow had hidden the usual landmarks that Nicholas used to find his way through the woods, so he began to use the stars to navigate in the long, dark nights. One day he crept past Little Rose's cottage and peered through a crack in the window just visible above the snow. He saw her sad, with her family in the cold. They had not saved any coal and the fire was not lit. It was Christmas Eve. Nicholas returned to his cottage through the chimney. He went through his grandfather's tools and fashioned a simple doll from wood. He also scooped a shovel full of coal from a pile by the fire. He looked around for something to carry the coal in and saw nothing. Then he spied one of his grandfather's socks hanging in front of the fire. Night fell and a swift shadow moved across the snow. 
It stopped at Little Rose's rooftop and climbed in through the chimney. The cottage was in darkness, and the family and animals were asleep. Nicholas silently lowered himself into the fireplace. He hung the stocking of coal on the fireplace, placed the doll on the bedside of Rose's cot, and vanished into the night. When heading back to the cottage, Nicholas saw something in the trees. It was a ghostly white reindeer and stood nearly ten feet tall. It silently stared at him, with a pure white foal stood next to him. They slowly turned and walked away. Christmas morning. Nicholas woke and lit a candle. It was now very clear that his grandfather and the others were lost. He sat alone and cried, but in the silence he could hear faint laughter. It was Rose's laughter, and she was playing. She was happy. A wisp of smoke rose from the chimney as they lit the first fire in weeks. Winter continued for several more weeks. Nicholas spent his time exploring the mountain further, developing his skills in the workshop. Spring soon arrived and the snow melted. The people of the village emerged from their long and difficult hibernation. A small memorial service was held to mark the loss of the six men on the mountain. It had been assumed that Nicholas would stay in his grandfather's cottage and fend for himself. The mountain folk were hard and offered him little comfort. As he left the service, Nicholas saw little Rose in the churchyard playing with a doll. She had made an embroidered clothes for it and was clear that she loved it dearly. Nicholas spent the year doing odd jobs for the locals in return for scraps of food. He would spend his evenings in the workshop. He slowly felt like he was becoming accepted into the community. The village often talked of the strange visitor in Rose's cottage on Christmas night. They were wary, but curious. Someone dared to suggest that the goodwill may be about to return to the mountain, but he was soon quickly silenced for fear of drawing the attention of the wee folk. Autumn arrived, and the villagers left for market. Nicholas followed to help. They proceeded down the mountain and through the old market, now deserted. They followed the road to the town and rolled down the main cobbled streets. It was the first time that most of the mountain people had been to the town and they looked at grand houses and shops with amazement. But all this was still so familiar to Nicholas. His old house was just round the corner and he craned his neck to see it. But the procession turned the other way, moved to the end of town and out across the other side of the valley. They arrived at the new market town at twilight. The majority of the trading had already been done with the other villagers from the other mountains and Nicholas's group had to work hard the following day to gather basic supplies for the winter. During market, Nicholas observed the children of the town. Even though they were well dressed and looked different, they were very much the same as the villagers' children, but they no longer recognised him as a boy from their town. One person that did recognise Nicholas was Thomas, his old teacher. He had sought out Nicholas and was delighted to see him again. Thomas listened intently as Nicholas told him of the tragedy and adventures of his new life on the mountain. Thomas was relieved that Nicholas was self-sufficient and was proud to hear that he was putting his brass telescope to good use. He was also very interested in the new maps that Nicholas had been drawing as he had been exploring the mountain. However, Thomas did raise an eyebrow when Nicholas began to tell him of the wee folk. Thomas was a scientist and a scholar and did not hold much faith in magic and superstition. He used to listen to Nicholas's father talking about the fantastic creatures that supposedly lived on the mountain, and they would often argue late into the night over their opposing views. He smiled quietly to himself, as he could see that these magical beliefs had been passed on from father to son. The day ended too quickly, and the two friends wished each other good health through the winter and promised to meet again at the next market. Nicholas and the mountain folk returned to the village in the woods as the call of the mountain echoed into the night. The animals were herded into the houses, and the supply gathered at market were divided up. Winter arrived, and the snow fell. Chapter 7 That year Nicholas was more prepared. He had plenty of food collected to last him the winter months, allowing him to concentrate on more important matters. The pile of coal that his grandfather had left him was still there, but the bucket was now empty. Nicholas spent his days exploring the woods and drawing up more maps of where he went and what he saw. Every day he travelled further up the mountain and saw many wonders such as frozen waterfalls and snow caves. He added more detail to the map with every trip. He also saw the footprints of the wee folk in the snow and often saw them out of the corner of his eye, dashing between the trees. They were, as his grandfather had described them, like wisps, like smoke. Nicholas saw that higher up the mountain, the trees became stranger, with tiny intricate carvings on them. He ran his hand over the patterns and traced the swirls and lines. Every branch of each tree was covered, and Nicholas wondered who had created such beautiful images and why. He travelled further up the mountain, where the snow was always deep and never melted. 
In the shadow of a huge rock outcrop, Nicholas found the entrance to an ancient cave, but didn't venture too near it when he heard the laughter of the wee folk inside. Just looking at the dark entrance made his blood run cold. On his way back to the cottage, Nicholas heard a strange sound coming from the trees. He explored further and found the great white deer that had regarded him the previous Christmas. It had fallen into a snowdrift and become tangled in exposed roots and was clearly in distress. Without hesitation, he freed the deer by cutting through the roots with his hatchet. It stood tall and looked down at him. Its snout was cut and bleeding. It walked slowly away into the woods. Over the next few days, Nicholas saw the great white reindeer more and more. Its snout had become to heal, but it would always have a great large scar. They eventually both became familiar and comfortable with each other as Nicholas tried to saddle it. He climbed up and the deer bolted. Nicholas held on for his life. They moved at extraordinary speed and passed through the valley silently. They travelled down the mountain and reached the abandoned marketplace within an hour. Nicholas looked across to the town in the valley. When they had returned to the mountain, the deer left them at the cottage and vanished into the woods. Christmas Eve arrived as it should, and the village remained silent. Nicholas made his way down the chimney of Little Rose's cottage. He smiled when he saw an empty stocking hanging on the fireplace. He filled it with coal from a bag on his back and placed a boy doll on her bedside. He could see that she still slept with last year's doll held tightly. When he returned to the fireplace, he spied a plate set to one side. It had a glass of milk and a small biscuit. He ate and drank silently and headed out. He travelled to the next cottage and found the same. Every house in the village was visited that night. Every child was given a toy. On Christmas morning, Nicholas peered over at the cottages of the village. Small wisps of smoke rose from each home. Laughter and happiness drifted on the breeze. Nicholas's Christmas activities had left his coal store depleted. He remembered his grandfather's story about his meeting as a young man with the king of the mountain and how he had witted him in his own throne room. His prize was unlimited coal, something the king of the mountain held no value in. The villagers in turn treated his grandfather's offer of coal with suspicion and fear. They did not accept it and rejected him for dealing with ancient spirits. Nicholas had known for a while that this moment would come. His grandfather was gone and the king of the mountain no longer had a deal to honour. Although the thought of it chilled him to the bone, he felt that it was time to meet this king. He journeyed up the mountain to the cave. The stones around the door were carved with ancient images. It was beautiful. He took a deep breath and swallowed his fear. Nicholas ventured in. Quiet laughter began. He moved further into the dark. He fell. He was tripped, shoved and pushed. Nicholas walked into a large chamber and stood before the king. He was this ancient and enormous creature, sitting alone on a throne as ancient as the mountain itself. He was once a man, but his legs were now roots in the ground, his face was as tough as the stones and rocks, his head were crowned with antlers. He was held within the cave as the world had slowly forgotten his presence and his power had waned, ruling sprites and spirits only barely visible to menfolk. What do you want, child of town who dwells in the woods? The sound of Nicholas's heart pounded in his ears and his mouth was dry with fear. Coal, I seek coal, he replied. Ah, once I gave it away willingly, but that trickster is now gone, and I will not be deceived as quickly again. What do you require then, my lord? I sent you a challenge. Travel to the highest peak of the mountain, and tell me what you find there. Return before sunrise, and you can have all the black stones you can carry. The peak is a day away! The wager is set. Tell me what you find by sunrise, or I'll see to it that you never return to your village. Nicholas stood at the mouth of the cave for a moment and considered everything. How could he possibly complete this impossible task? Then his salvation arrived. In the mist he saw a slash of crimson in the white expanse. His reindeer ran to him and bowed low. Nicholas mounted him and they were off. The climb was hard, even for a ten-foot reindeer. The wind grew stronger and the ice in the air burned his skin. They moved towards the twin prongs of the highest peak in the dark night. A lantern hung from each of the reindeer's antlers to guide their way. Sticking out of the snow and set away from the path was a cart. His grandfather's cart, now long empty. His anger and contempt for the king of the mountain to send him on such a cruel quest was too much to bear. Nicholas's tears froze painfully on his cheeks as he dug the cart from the snow. The wheels were useless in the deep snow, so he took them off. He used his hatchet to fashion runners from tree branches nearby. He hooked the sledge to the deer, much to its discomfort and protests. The wind fought him as much on the way back than on the way up. 
He could feel the sun slowly trying to rise through the clouds they fought on. They arrived at the cave entrance and Nicholas walked through the hall. I have done as you asked. I have travelled to the top of the mountain and returned. Nicholas shouted into the dark. And what did you see there? I saw what was left of my village's courage. I saw what was left of my grandfather. Nicholas shouted through the tears. Indeed, young one. You may take what you can carry. Your tiny pockets will always be full. I hope you now see what is in store for those wishing to cross my mountain into the greater world. I can carry more than my pockets will allow, my lord. I can carry far more. The deer and sleigh thundered into the cavern. The king of the mountain roared with curses in a language long forgotten and made the halls shake. The wee folk in the shadows laughed at the deception and mocked their king. You are a trickster and wise in equal measures, but I honour our wager. Take your call but know this. You have earned the respect of the children of the mountain as much as I have lost it. I am old and nearly forgotten. Soon I will pass through the mountain into other realms. Next time we meet, I wonder if you may take my place and release me. My lord, I do not wish to dwell in this mountain in the dark and live for ages. I wish to live, bring happiness to people. I shall take my prize and wish you well. They arrived back in the village as night fell. The reindeer gave Nicholas a cold stare at the effort of the hall. Nicholas patted him on his crimson scarred nose and quietly thanked his friend and ally. He unloaded the sledge at the first thaw and hid it in the stable to avoid the villagers' eyes. Nicholas was sad that to provide them with too much coal would meet with stubborn refusal, but also happy that he could provide them with small happiness in the darkest nights of the year and keep a small light burning till spring. Chapter 8 Over the next few years, Christmas had become a time of celebration in the village. Word spread of these strange events, and nearby villages on the mountain began to experience the same miracles. Further time passed, and Nicholas attended every market every year to meet with his friend Thomas. Thomas's family seemed to grow every year, and would often bring his children along to market to meet Nicholas, so they could hear about life on the mountain. He was pleased to hear that Thomas now lived in the house in town that Nicholas had once shared with his family. Nicholas's time in the village had led to acceptance by these strange folk. He was the only person there who could read and write, and now he had taught these skills to many of the children. He had become the closest thing to a teacher that the village had ever had. When not teaching, Nicholas spent much of the year alone in the workshop making toys for his Christmas deliveries. His most loyal and true friend was the reindeer with whom he spent his winters crossing the mountain as if it was just a molehill, exploring more wonders and drawing up more maps. He used the reindeer to transport him from village to village on Christmas night, and the sound of hooves on rooftops had become as much of a cause of celebration as the stocking full of gifts and coal to brighten the dark days of winter. It would be true to say that these villages on Christmas Day shone with brilliance and spirit that was as new to the world as the great day that gives us all cause to celebrate Christmas in the first place. Nicholas also had a significant other in his life now, and had grown very close to Rose, who was now a young woman. They were in love and planned to marry in the summer. The day before the wedding, Nicholas decided to show her the other part of his life beyond fixing roofs, tending animals and teaching the local children to read. But his revelation of the coal store, the workshop and his Christmas excursions were of no surprise to Rose, much to his own astonishment. Every year I've seen you in my house on Christmas night. Your eyes have glowed brighter each year with a spirit that this village has never seen before. Plus your waistline is bigger than your meagre income will allow. I hope that your love for my biscuits on Christmas Eve is but a close second place to your love for me. Nicholas and Rose had a quiet wedding in the village church and promised to stay together forever. From that point, Nicholas no longer worked alone. Rose visited the workshop every day, making further toys and accessories from cloth and weave. She delighted in giving Nicholas's rough-hewn toys further details and a softer touch. Christmas came quickly that year. Rose and Nicholas made the preparations with one exception. That year he got a gift. Something to allow me to see you in the snow, to let me know that you're safe. Rose said with a smile. It was a thick coat made from felt. It was bright red in contrast against the white of the snow. I worry when you go out. A number of accidents may befall you. I am also terrified that the wee folk will take exception to your antics and set you up for a fall. Oh, don't worry about the wee folk, Nicholas replied. They appear to have a soft spot for me, and sometimes I feel they may even be helping me on my travels. 
Nicholas put on his new coat over his tunic and pulled his grandfather's belt around his waist. He pulled on his thick boots and gloves, his teacher's telescope and compass attached to his belt. His maps had been carefully rolled and tucked into a satchel slung over his shoulder. He set off up the chimney into the night. Chapter 9 the crimson-nosed reindeer helped him traverse the mountain while Rose sat in Nicholas's chair by the fire, quietly waiting for him to return. Near morning, she would feel the warmth of his hand rousing her from sleep, and then he, in turn, would sleep for an age, all the time with a smile on his face. Further years passed, and the mountain became a place of celebration, a happy place. Rose and Nicholas spent every moment together, save the night of Christmas. Nicholas became middle-aged, with a thicker belly, but his chimney-climbing skills remained without equal. He grew a beard as was customary in the mountains, and it became flecked with grey. He had also taken to smoking his grandfather's pipe when sitting by the fireplace. As his Christmas journeys became more ambitious, Nicholas struggled to make it home for dawn, but he always seemed to manage it, as if the very night was waiting for him to return home safely before releasing the sun. The people of the mountain now had no memory of a life before their Christmas saint. This legend had been heard in the town for many years, but was dismissed as native folklore and superstition. A further wonder befell Nicholas during these Christmases. For each year over eight years, his lead reindeer would be joined by an additional reindeer, as if to offer further help to fulfil his crusade. He no longer rode one on bareback, but now a fleet of nine pulled his sleigh through the woods. At market one year, Nicholas's old friend Thomas had met him as normal. Thomas's grown children and grandchildren now brought him to market on a cart, as age was catching up with him and he now struggled to walk. Despite the turn of time, the two old friends talked as if they had always done, while Rose spent time with Thomas's wife and family. Thomas teased Nicholas as whether he had seen the father of Christmas dashing through the night sky. Nicholas smiled and kept the truth to himself. They reminisced about their lives as they did every year, and Thomas introduced Nicholas to his four grandchildren. At the end of the day, the two old friends said farewell. However, this year it was to be more than that. Thomas was much older than Nicholas, and had been finding the trip to market more difficult over the years. With sadness in his heart, he told Nicholas that he feared that he may not be able to make it the following year. Nicholas understood. They shook hands warmly and wished each other good health. Just as Nicholas was about to leave, Thomas called him back and gave him a letter. It simply read, Dear Sir, we wonder why you have not visited our town. The children of the town are good and kind, and I hope that you may see this letter yourself. Yours sincerely, John, David, Laura, Rowan, William, Finn, Theo, Stephanie, Molly, Bethany, Lucy, Daisy, James, Henry, Adam, Blake, Ava, Zachary, Isaac, Jacob, Aaron, Robert, Gabriel, Freddie, Isabel, Harry, Luke. Thomas explained that the children of the school were fascinated by the legend of the father of Christmas that flew over the mountain. He had settled down their chatter by promising to give their letter to someone who lived on the mountain, who may be able to pass it on to this mysterious spirit. Nicholas remembered his life in the town, what seemed lifetimes ago. He remembered the joy shared by his family at Christmas. There was no time to waste. Despite the objections of Rose, he made the preparations to extend his run to the town and planned a route. He noted the name of each child from the letter and began to make something special for each. Nothing as grand as their homes or lifestyles in the town, though. For the first time, Nicholas felt self-conscious. Would it be enough? Would they reject his efforts? Time would tell as Christmas night fell. Nicholas visited every home on the mountain, and the night had nearly ended when he reached the main street of the town. He went to work and succeeded in every home, but instead of climbing through the chimneys, he now lowered the treats down, which also included delicious baked goods courtesy of Rose. He had begun to feel the pangs of age, and no longer sought out excessive acrobatics. Plus, Rose's baked treats weren't just given to the children of the mountain, and his expanding waistline was a struggle with the narrow chimneys of the town. Nicholas rounded a corner of the main street and stopped in his tracks. His eyes welled with tears as he looked across the road at his old home. It was much the same as when he lived there, save a few minor details and changes since it had been rebuilt. He remembered his family and the happy times he'd shared. Many years had passed, but these memories were as clear as the moon still shining in the sky. It had been these enduring memories that he wanted to share with others and to pass on just a fraction of the happiness he had felt at Christmas. The tears of sadness were now replaced with tears of happiness. A new family now lived there, with children who would wake on Christmas morning with joy in their hearts. He would make sure of that. He mounted the sleigh and made his way out of town, but it was not his intention to return home just yet. 
Nicholas changed his clothes into something befitting the clothing of the town, and he walked among townspeople for the first time since he was a child. Although his own Christmases were happy and full of joy, many of the other folk of the town remained as grey and sad as the stone of their houses. This morning was different. He was presented with a bustling sight of happy people and families greeting each other on Christmas morning. The children played with their toys, while the parents marvelled at the previous night's events. The windows of his old home were filled with a warm glow. Nicholas could see the family inside standing around their Christmas tree holding hands and singing carols. One of the children waved to him out of the window. On Christmas morning, Thomas had woken from his sleep to the sound of his grandchildren shouting with joy. He settled in his armchair next to the twinkling lights of the Christmas tree, surrounded by his family who were singing carols. Hello! shouted little Betty, waving out of the window. Thomas looked up and out of the window. For a moment, he saw someone in the street looking up at the house, but he vanished in a blink. Grandfather, how does Father Christmas visit every house in one night? asked Betty. Thomas thought for a moment and replied, Magic. Thank you, my most wonderful student, my dearest friend. Thomas whispered. The town shone. It shone with a spirit that had not been seen before. When Nicholas finally returned home, Rose made him promise that he would never be out after dawn, a solemn oath never to be broken. Chapter 10. More years passed. Rose and Nicholas were now the oldest people in the village, and still never left each other's side, save on Christmas night. The mountain villages and surrounding towns shone every Christmas day like a beacon in the dark to the rest of the world. The reindeer remained faithful and loyal. The leader would return every year with his company of eight. Every year Rose would sit by the fireplace until dawn, when the warm touch of her hand would comfort her that Nicholas was home and safe. The last present was always for her. Every year Nicholas would consider crossing the mountain to the greater world. One Christmas night, his route took him to the very top of the mountain, and with some time to spare, he glanced over the ridge. The world laid below him for miles and as far as the eye could see. Could it be possible to help everyone? His head said no, but his heart said yes. It was a hard year. Winter lingered. In fact, the snow didn't really leave the village that year. Nicholas surveyed the village that had been his home for a lifetime. It was now largely deserted. The young had grown up and moved away to larger villages and towns, leaving just a few huts now occupied. He had found his range stretching further each year in a bid to provide happiness to more, but also to reach the families of the village that now lived further away in pursuit of a better life than the meagre one that the mountain could provide. He had written and kept detailed lists of the children that he once delivered to, and in turn their children who were now the recipients of his gifts. Rose stood close and observed that they had seen a lonely and isolated place become happy and joyous, and that joy had now spread. He hadn't just affected the lives of the village, but brought happiness to so many people beyond. But secretly Nicholas felt old and tired. The spirit was becoming a crutch to hold him up, as opposed to the fire that once fuelled his crusade. He was sad that his life with Rose had not given them any children, and that they were now alone in the woods with no one to pass the spirit on to. Rose could read him like a book. Nonsense. The children of the villages and the towns carry the same spirit and will in turn pass it on to their children now that the fire has been lit. It will burn forever as long as the people want it to. But what of the others over the mountain? What of the greater world that we have been separated from for so long? You cannot help everyone, Nicholas. The mountain is there for a reason. One man can achieve only so much and you have achieved that already. If you try to break the mountain, it will only break you. How can you be sure? How can you be sure that it can't be done? If we start now, we could try. And if you were to fail, you could suffer the same fate as your grandfather. You achieved so much and I have never asked anything from you. Save that you hold my hand at dawn. If you do this, I fear my hand would stay cold. It had to be done. It had to be tried. It was a hard year. Chapter 11. Christmas Eve. The sleigh had been filled to the brim. The reindeer arrived in procession as they should. Red Nose stood in front, tall and proud. Nicholas hooked up the sleigh and glanced back at Rose. Tears brimmed in her eyes. Tears made from equal measures of pride and fear. He smiled and winked. He pulled his coat tightly and rolled his whip and let fly. The deer pulled for a moment and then sped away. The mountain villages and towns were as familiar as his workshop and he set to work with ease. But now for the peak. It was a stormy night and the wind howled down the mountainside. 
The deer surged forward, and the snow was deep. The wind burned their eyes and skin, trying to drive them back, further, further, bit by bit. The peak was now visible in the dark. Red Nose turned back, so as if to check that they should really proceed. Onward, boys! Onward! Just a little further. The deer were up to their haunches in snow. The sleigh began to stick. Nicholas got out to push. Nothing. Onward, boys! Onward! The deer pulled one more time. The body of the sleigh came away from its runners and rolled over into a deep drift of snow. Nicholas was taken with it. The sleigh rolled over several times and finally it righted, but was now completely covered in snow with Nicholas still in it. Nicholas was at the reins, called into the wind in frustration. Not here, not now! The deer stayed close to tend to Nicholas and keep him warm as best they could, but to no avail. He could feel his life fading in the cold. It was the same spot his grandfather fell trying to save his village so many years before. Rose! He closed his eyes and could see her sitting by the fireplace. Rose, I'm, I'm going to be late. Then silence, and the wind stopped. The reindeer lay down, the snow settled, and the sky cleared. Then a voice whispered on the wind. Are you ready, child of the town who dwells on the mountain? Are you ready to take my place? As dawn drew close, the wind fell, and the snow across the mountain glittered like diamonds. Not a creature had disturbed it, no footprints could be seen. Back in the village, Rose's hand grew warmer, and she smiled in her sleep. You are late, my love, she said quietly. Rose didn't want to open her eyes and wake from this dream. Was it a dream? She opened her eyes slowly, but he was no longer there. But lying on her lap was the toy she treasured so much as a child, as perfect as the day it was given to her. Chapter 12 Spring arrived and passed. Summer came and became autumn. Rose took slow walks in the woods to fill her days and read by candlelight at night. She comforted herself by reading through the many thank you letters written by children over the years. She traced the lives of so many through their childhood and then their children. A map of their lives lay before her. Nicholas had kept all of this and every year he made a list of every child. He always checked it twice so no one would be neglected. Rose had decided early that year that she wouldn't take up Nicholas's tools, so the workshop lay dormant and gathered dust again behind a locked door. As the year waned, Rose dreaded the coming Christmas. Winter arrived with the call of the mountain and the snow fell. Christmas Eve came, but this day was not welcome in the lonely house on the mountain. As was her custom, Rose settled down in front of the fireplace with a candle burning and fell into a dreamless sleep. As dawn drew close, the wind fell and the snow across the mountain settled. Not a creature had disturbed it, no footprints could be seen. But something stirred and the sound of bells rang quietly in the night. Rose's hand grew warmer and she smiled in her sleep. You are late, my love, she whispered. She slowly opened her eyes and saw Nicholas standing over her. He held her hand and smiled, now a luminous being. Come with me, I have something to show you. Rose closed her eyes once more. She felt Nicholas carrying her, the snow crunched under his boots. She could hear the deer pawing in the snow and the bells of the sleigh ringing. Nicholas laid her carefully next to him in the sleigh without any effort. She was warmly wrapped in a blanket as the sleigh sped away up the mountain. Trees dashed past in the blink as the sun rose. They reached the entrance to the cave in moments, its mouth now glowing with warm light. Are we bound here, Nicholas? I'm now the king of the mountain, but I'm not trapped here. As long as the people want me, the world is mine to roam. The world? But how? asked Rose. The wee folk will help us. The cavern was warm and bright, with tunnels leading off in every direction. Nicholas showed Rose their new home. In time, he emptied the cottage and brought their meagre belongings into one of the smaller and cosier caverns. The shadows of the wee folk began to take form, and Rose began to see them for the first time, as opposed to a glimpse out the corner of an eye. She taught them manners and made them clothes. More time passed and the underground palace became home. Nicholas and Rose worked at their leisure. The wee folk helped them produce toys of the finest quality and detail. The mischievous side of the wee folk manifested itself from time to time, but it was nothing that Nicholas or Rose couldn't put right without a stern glare or strong word. As Christmas Eve arrived, the final preparations were made, and the sleigh stood in the main cavern with the reindeer hooked up. Nicholas stood tall and proud next to Rose. He was old, and his beard no longer held any colour other than silver, 
but he had the energy of a child and the strength of a white reindeer. He wore his red coat and hat, as he always did, with his belt loaded with a telescope, compass and rolls of maps. Rose stood next to him and held his hand. I'll be waiting at dawn. Don't be late. I'll never be late for you, he smiled. What happens now? Rose whispered. When I close my eyes, I can see every child who holds hope in their heart. They shine like stars on earth. There are so many. And we have all the time we need. Nicholas walked around the sleigh and the deer once more to check that everything was as it should be. He stopped to scratch the lead deer on his red scarred nose. He regarded the deer as his guardian and protector ever since his grandfather had left so many years before. Why have you named all the others but not him? Rose asked. He does have a name, but not one I've ever said aloud. Nicholas looked down at the belt around his waist. It still had his grandfather's name etched into the buckle. Rudolph. His name is Rudolph. Nicholas climbed into the sleigh and held the reins. The deer kicked at the ground, urging the sleigh forward. He unfurled his whip and let fly. Nicholas's voice boomed through the mountain hall. On Dasher, on Dancer, on Prancer and Vixen, on Comet, on Cupid, on Donder and Blitzen. Rudolph, take us away! The sleigh flew forward and burst from the cave like lightning. Nicholas laughed as they reached the top of the mountain. <laughs> he laughed with pure joy as the company of deer and his sleigh crested the impassable peaks and flew forward into the sky. The world lay before him, small lights in the dark like tiny beacons. As he sped forward, the lights burned brighter and brighter. The world now began to glow with pure joy. Joy to the world. And that was just the beginning. The Boy Who Became Father Christmas, The Story of Santa Claus, starring James Wilmot, Rowan Wilmot, Henry Wilmot, Adrian Wilmot, Tilly Francis, Lisa Shepard and Elliot Richardson. Audiobook produced by Zach Gant, Sam Jones, Kelly Shepard, Camille Croucher-Jones and Kyrae Knight.